Okay, here we go. So first off, welcome to the renting in, Am in the Amsterdam metropolitan area. My name is Mary. Uh, I've been uh, working at EHN for almost three years now. I'm the operations officer and I work a lot on the rental side as well. Hence, I'm, uh, hence I give these presentations. I'm half Welsh, half American and I moved to Amsterdam three years ago and I'm really happy to now call it my home. So hopefully with, uh, with some of this information, it might help you guys get to that stage a bit quicker than I did. <laughs> First, let's talk about what we're going to be going through tonight. Uh, first off, we're going to be talking about what types of apartments might be suitable to your needs, the areas in which you might want to live, um, the general costs of living in the Amsterdam, Amsterdam metropolitan area, resources that will help you search the market, the types of contracts to expect to see when you come to the Netherlands, and some little tips and tricks and things to consider as well. First, let's discuss the Amsterdam housing market. Now, these are some words that you might have heard. You might have heard that the housing market is expensive, it's ruthless, the properties are very small, it moves super quickly, it's really tough to maneuver. And yes, all of this is true, but there are ways to work around it if you just know what to look for. So don't let these words deter you. Granted, it can, it can seem a bit overwhelming, but there are absolutely ways to negotiate it and navigate it. So don't let that be of a concern to you. First off, we're going to discuss why the Amsterdam housing market is moves so quickly and is so competitive for us expats. So looking at the left side column, you'll see that 54% uh, that out of 100% of the properties available in the Netherlands, 54% of these are regulated rental sector, no, otherwise known or similar to social housing. So this is when there's a base rent of 720 euros maximum. And to get on the waiting list, it's to, uh, to get one of these properties is between 10 and 14 years. And also you actually need to be native Dutch. So at these points, that 54% of the uh, properties would, on, the regulated, uh, on the regulated rental sector would not be available to expats. Now the remaining 46% of these properties is the free sector. And this is where the rent is not regulated and the landlords can charge whichever, whichever pr price that they would like uh, for the rent of their property. Now, of course, they will, of course, charge in line with the market. If they were to charge extortionate amounts, no one would want to rent their home. But because of this being the free sector, people, it, you can see that it has definitely crept up, especially in comparison to the, uh, to the regulated rental market. Of that 46%, these would be available to expats. And now this will work. This is where we move on to the column to our right. Of that 46% of the properties, only 90% of those properties are privately owned and inhabited already, which leaves us, the rental expats, that 10%, that little orange sliver, which would be available for you guys to rent. Now, this shows just why the market moves so quickly and why it's so competitive. So just to, that's just to kind of give you an idea. And moving on here, again, this is just reiterating what I've just said, but obviously in a different visual. So you'll see all of the properties, the 239,000 are, uh, 239, are regulated rental homes, 194,000 are the private sector homes, and then that 19,458 are now available to rent. Now I'm going to talk about the, uh, the different types of apartments that would be available to you when moving to the Netherlands. And what might be and what might be most suitable to you. So in the top left, you'll see the shell apartment. Now the shell apartment is exactly what it says on the tin. It is quite literally a shell. These are most likely these are more, most likely um, big new builds. Um, absolutely, they're very large. They're very modern. Um, most of the time, they are not in the city of Amsterdam anyway. Uh, they tend to be a bit more on the outskirts. And most of the time, they're also owned by corporations or big investors. So with a shell apartment, as you'll see in the picture in the top left, there is no floor. So it's just the concrete and the walls also need to be painted. So if you were to rent a shell apartment, putting in the floor is most likely going to be your responsibility. Occasionally you might get a shell with a floor in or the last tenant might be willing to sell you their floor. But that is something to think about. But the best thing about a shell apartment is due to the fact that there, it's quite literally a shell. A, the rent is significantly cheaper. And B, the deposit might also be cheaper. You should, I'll talk about this later, but I'll just touch on it now. But deposits tend to be two months rent. But with a shell apartment, it can sometimes be negotiated. And then for the third point, 
there's nothing for you to damage. So there's absolutely no uh, no choice, uh, no chance that you would have your deposit taken away from you at the end of your tenancy. So that's the good parts about a shell apartment. Now moving on to the unfurnished apartment, which is below on the left. As you'll see, it's got the floor, it's got all the fittings, um, the walls are all complete. All you need to do is add in um, your big furniture, uh, curtains, and most of the time lights as well. So when it comes to unfurnished apartments in the Netherlands, it's very common that you'll go into a fully ready apartment to just uh, to just move your furniture into, but you might need to put in your light fit, uh, fittings. Um, but that, that is a very standard thing to do. Occasionally, uh, you can negotiate with the landlord for them to fit some in, but just be prepared and aware that if you go for an unfurnished, you might need to put in your own lights. And now moving to the furnished apartment, which is on the top right, it is quite literally a fully furnished apartment. Most of the time when it comes to fully furnished apartments in the Netherlands, they even come with crockery, um, with your silverware, sometimes with sheets as well. So it's very much a, ch a chance for you to kind of bring in your own suitcase just with clothes and you're ready to live in the Netherlands. Now, when it comes to furnished apartments, I used to live in one myself. I lived in one for a year and a half. It was wonderful. It was a perfect introduction to the city because it allowed us to kind of have the freedom to look around the neighborhoods until we wanted to get a more secure place. But what I did find is living there long term, the property never really feels like your own home because you're living with someone else's belongings. So it kind of feels like you're staying somewhere long term in an Airbnb. But if that's what you're looking for, if you're looking for maybe a two year lease or a year and a bit, then absolutely perfect. Now I'll quickly discuss some neighborhoods and the proximity uh, from um, Amsterdam and its surrounding cities. First, we're gonna talk about uh, Amsterdam uh, and then the center, and then I'll move, uh, move a little bit out. So as you can see in this map, um, you've got the different neighborhoods. You've got Nord, you've got Zaudos, you've got Zou, New West, um, Demon. Um, and thing is on the map, it looks quite far away. But a good thing to know is by bike, you can get from one end of the city to the other in about 45 minutes. So you're never far from anything when you're in Amsterdam. And that was something that I really had to get my head around when I came here. Um, I used to live um, in England, very near London, and I always was quite intimidated by London because it was just huge. And I never really thought that such a famous city as Amsterdam would feel so small and manageable. And that's one of the reasons why I love it here. So even if you are looking in, let's say Zaudos, even though it looks furthest away from the center, it's about yeah 45 minutes, half an hour. And now we'll talk about the surrounding metropolitan cities. So um, when, you, when it comes to, for example, living, well, when it comes to living in Amsterdam, most of the costs of renting is for the fact that you are paying to live in Amsterdam. And that's why the rent is so high. Whereas if you go to one of the surrounding cities, which I'm just about to mention, then you'll see that the, re that the rent is significantly decreases purely because it's just not Amsterdam and these surrounding cities are really really easy to access the, cent the center of Amsterdam. So we'll start off with Harlem. Harlem is a beautiful little city. Um, it's known as the mini Amsterdam. It's got all of the charm, it's got all of the canals and uh, the beautiful architecture but it doesn't have the tourists. But in the recent years it has that's really got a got attraction and the rental prices are slightly increasing and we're seeing them beginning to increase but they're still not quite Amsterdam so Harlem if you're looking to live that kind of Amsterdam lifestyle but without the Amsterdam cost Harlem would be the one for you and also as you can see it's only 15 it's only a 15 minute train directly to the center of Amsterdam so super easy to access now, when it comes to Hof, uh, Hofdorp and Amstelveen, they don't have quite the same feel as Amsterdam. They are newer kind of cities, um, and but the rent is, again, significantly cheaper and only 25 minutes, around half an hour away. You'll see in Amstelveen there are two times. So that's because we can't, Amstelveen is quite, quite large. So from one end of Amstelveen, it can take 40 minutes to get to, to Amsterdam. And from the other end, it just takes you 20 minutes. But it is, they are directly connected. Now, Hilversum, which looks the farthest away, is only 20 minutes away to the center of Amsterdam. And I'd say this is one of the cheapest places to live if you want to be in the Amsterdam metropolitan area. And then moving on to Almira as well. Um, it is a little bit further in that it takes half an hour to 40 minutes, but again, a really good a really good option to look for if you're looking to kind of reduce the costs a bit 
now I'm going to continue talking about costs. So as I was mentioning earlier, um, when it comes to living in Amsterdam, you're very much paying to live in the city of Amsterdam. And this will, of course, well, this is kind of to show you exactly what I'm talking about. These numbers are, of course, averages. Um, I'm not saying that you're not going to get anything under 1,100 euros, but most, but they are hard to come by, uh, come by anything under 1,100 euros in Amsterdam. So if we I won't walk you through all the prices. You can, of course, look back at it in your own time. But at this point, I'm just going to start comparing the studios for you. So when we just so when we talk about studios, that is just a one open space uh, with an open bedroom, kitchen, living, dining zone. So it's just a one big studio space. In Amsterdam, these cost between 1,100 euros to 1,400 euros, whereas in Hilversum, pretty much cuts that price in half, 650 euros to 900 euros. So this just really demonstrates the costs of living in Amsterdam. And again, moving up to, let's go to the three bedroom just so that we can discuss both extremes. For a three bedroom apartment in Amsterdam, it'll be 2,400 euros up, whereas in Hilversum, again, almost half price with 1,300. And speaking of costs, I'll continue on with additional costs that you should be aware of as well. First, we're going to discuss the deposit. So for a lease deposit, the standard amount is two months worth of rent. Um, this can vary depending on the property, depending on the landlord as well. So it is case dependent, but we'd say about maybe 90% of the time it's two months worth deposit. But occasionally it can be one month deposit if it's cut may, maybe perhaps a shell um, or on the flip side if you go for like a high-end luxury fully furnished apartment it could potentially be three months and it's also dependent on your situation as well but always just be prepared to have two months worth of deposit ready to go because in order to have your keys handed over to you for the check-in you need to a have paid the two months worth of deposit and be also paid for your first month's worth of rent. So essentially, that's the value of three months worth of rent that you need to be able to pay directly in order to have your check in. Another thing on this point that I'd like to mention when it comes to deposits is unlike in the UK anyway, over here, there is no deposit protection holding scheme. It's held directly by the landlord. When I first moved here, I thought that was a bit of a, an odd concept, just kind of giving thousands of euros to, to my landlord. Um, but it is what it is what's done here. Obviously, we wish we could have deposit holding uh, protective schemes. But at this point, that is not about in the Netherlands. So don't be shocked if uh, if your contract states you need to give your deposit directly to your landlord. When it comes to your to your utilities, again, this is just kind of an average, something to expect. But when it comes to water, gas, and electricity, these vary between 100 euros to 150 euros if you're single or a couple. But then if you're moving up to a family, this can cost between uh, around 200 euros per month as well. So with these costs, you can somewhat, yeah, you can somewhat, um, uh, you can sort of forgot the word there. <laughs> um, you can, uh, you can basically choose or you well, it's cost dependent. Sorry, that's what I wanted to say. It's usage dependent. So it depends on how much you uh, water and electricity use, and it's up to you to control. But this is a good average to kind of think about. And then on top of that, another extra cost would be, of course, television and internet. And this can also somewhat be controlled by your choice as you this is depends on the package that you would choose. This varies between 50 and 100 euros a month. And the third cost we'll talk about now is the Amsterdam municipality taxes. So these are uh, the numbers that I'm about to tell you about are the Amsterdam numbers. So they, the numbers do vary slightly depending on the municipality that you're in or the surrounding city, but these will give you a good idea of what to expect nonetheless. For a one person household, it would be 499 euros per year. And for a two plus household, 721 euros per year. Now these are a one-time uh, one annual payment, so once a year, um, and you can either pay them off in one fell swoop, or if you just don't have that cash lying around, the municipality is very flexible when it comes to paying it back in monthly installments. So that's also a possibility. Now let's quickly discuss the resources that will help you search the market. First off, there are, of course, online search platforms. So there's Perarius, which is specifically for rentals, and there's also Funda. Now, Funda does have a lot of uh, purchasing properties, but it does also have rental properties on there. Uh, so it's always nice to have a, have a look around in Funda, but Perarius is rental specific. 
And then we're going to now move on to corporations and investors. So as I was mentioning earlier with the shelves and the larger building uh, and the larger new builds, these do tend to be owned by corporations and investors. And a lot of them do have wonderful properties, but there's something to really keep in mind if you are going to work with these investors and the corporations. Since they have so many properties, there it's a lot harder to kind of control the housing process with them. They aren't as communicative and they have a lot more kind of hoops to jump through. So they'll have, they'll require more paperwork or occasionally it might be done on a, on a lottery basis where they just kind of pick an offer at random. And it's a lot harder to control actually getting, uh, getting your property secured. And occasionally it can also take around six weeks to actually get a confirmation or a check-in. But of course, if you fall in love with the property that is as a corporation, please do go for it. They do have wonderful properties, but just be aware it can take more time and the communication is sometimes not, not desirable. <laughs> I, I always wish that I could get spoken to at the drop of a hat, but then occasionally they don't even have phone numbers. It'll just be emailing. So it just runs a bit more slowly when it comes to that. Another thing that you could also consider would be social platforms, of course, for example, Craigslist, Facebook, and CameraNet. Now, when it comes to these social platforms, I will again go into further detail about this uh, later on in the presentation but please make sure that these properties are legal and that you are able to actually live there the first thing that you need to check is if you can register at the property if you can't register at the property then you legally cannot live there and it's a sublet so please steer clear because then if someone if you were to be living there and you were to be found out you would be evicted and it would just be a messy messy situation so if you are looking on these platforms, please do make sure that they are legal and that you can actually stay there and that it is not a sublet. Now, moving on, we'll talk about some housing agents. Now, these are housing agents that we work with quite a lot and housing agents that we trust. So if you'd like, you can go directly to their websites to kind of see what they've got on, uh, what properties they've got on file, or they will also uh, most of the time end up on Peraria or Funda as well. But if you just wanted to look at housing agents specifically, these are ones that we trust. So they'd be, for example, JLG Real Estate, AHAM, Copes, uh, HB Housing, Interhouse, Neuro Estate, and Borisma. Um, yeah, like I said, they're easy to work with um, and they're very communicative and they do have nice properties as well. And again, totally legal. Now, if you're looking at potentially finding a flatmate in order to then um, look for property to rent together, perhaps you might have a low budget by yourself, but then you, you might want to find a sharer who can help you um, pay rent together, then Expat Housing Network has actually put together their own website called Tenant Hub, uh, where you can go on and you can put in the requirements for what you are looking for. So say, for example, uh, you, your certain budget, the neighborhood in which you're looking, uh, furnished, unfurnished, etc. And then, um, then you can match up with people who have the same requirements as you. And you can then go ahead and discuss um, maybe organize a meetup to see if you'd actually be able to be flatmates and then from there you can find a property together. Now we're going to quickly talk about apartment sharing because this is something that does come up a lot. So the local law prohibits the sharing of an, of an apartment by more than two unrelated adults. So of course if you're, if you're a family that's not a problem at all. This is more targeted at young professionals or people who are just quickly moving over for a job and looking for a flatmate. If you are unrelated then you most of the time the local uh, you can only share with two unrelated adults. Now, there is the possibility of sharing with more than two adults, but when it comes to this, the landlord has to purchase a specific, um, a, a specific certificate uh, in order to say that he is allowed to have more than two people register at his property. Now, this certificate costs the landlord money, so most landlords would prefer not to pay for this, which is why most of the time, if you're looking to share with someone, it's it's significantly easier if you're just sharing with one other person. As soon as you go upwards of two, that's when it starts to get a bit tricky and your pool of available properties will significantly shrink. And so again, this is gonna to be touching back quickly on the camera net and the Craigslist and the Facebook um, ads that I was just discussing. If you're renting a room in an existing rental, so for example, you're just looking for a room in a house share, you have to make sure that you can register and that you have permission to live there by the landlord. If in doubt, if in doubt, just contact the landlord directly um, and just 
talk to them and say hey are you aware that I'm living here <laughs> and then if they say no then obviously that's a big red flag um, and of course like I said please make sure that you can register um, if, if you are looking to uh, rent, a, rent a flat, as I mentioned earlier, you can also go on Tenant Hub um, and then that way you can find someone who you'd like to share with and then find a, a free sector rental together. Now I'm going to quickly talk about the main types of contract that you'll, contracts that you'll see here in the Netherlands as well. So the first one I'll talk about is the definite contract, otherwise known as the Model B contract. So when it comes to the Model B contract, um, it tends to be a maximum of two years. But the good thing about this contract is that there's no minimum time period. All you need to do is give a calendar month's notice and then you can break the lease. So the reason why this can be good for some people is, say, for example, if you're moving to Amsterdam and you want to rent in order to buy, but you just want something kind of shorter term um, and you don't want to be locked in for a specific amount of time, the definite contract might be the one for you. Or if you're unsure if, if your job is going to relocate, for example, or for example, you you might unfortunately lose your job. Who knows if you're if there's any uncertainty, a Model B contract might be good for you. The second type of contract that I'll discuss now is the indefinite contract, otherwise known as the Model A contract. So the Model A contract has a minimum period of one year that you cannot get out of unless you were to add a diplomatic clause. So you can always um, add a diplomatic clause into your offer, but it's not guaranteed that the landlord or the agent is going to accept this. <clears throat> so just be prepared um, in mind. If you go for a Model A contract, it's, very, it's quite likely that you'll be locked in for that one year. But the good thing about this is after that one year, then your contract moves on to a monthly rolling contract and you can break the lease at any point that you'd like after that one year and it can go on indefinitely. It's incredibly difficult to be evicted in the Netherlands unless it's a sublet, for example, or if, for example, you just stop paying rent for a couple months. <laughs> it's very difficult. The, the tenant rights in, in the Netherlands are a lot stronger than they are in the UK anyway. So if you wanted, you could stay in an, an indefinite contract indefinitely, hence the name. Here are now some other things to consider. First off, are you a smoker? So when it comes to renting in the Netherlands, it's absolutely illegal to smoke inside your rental property. So if you are a smoker or if you like to have parties and you have friends who do smoke, it might be an idea for you to look for a property with a balcony or an outside space. Um, obviously, it's just nice to have an outside space anyway. But if you are, if you do, if you do like to smoke, I'd recommend definitely looking for a little balcony for a uh, little, yeah, for a little balcony to sit out on. And then we'll move on to pets. So when it, rent, uh, when it comes to renting with pets, it is not impossible, of course. It does just make it a little bit trickier. So when it comes to renting with pets, we'd always recommend going for an unfurnished apartment. Most landlords, because it is essentially a landlord's market, it's a very competitive market. If a landlord is renting out a furnished apartment, they will most likely go for a, uh, for a prospective tenant who does not have pets versus a tenant who might do um, and then have a cat who might scratch up the sofa, for example. Another thing that I'd like to mention when it comes to pets is obviously the more pets you have, the harder it is. And the bigger pets you have, the harder it is to secure a property. So one or two cats is absolutely fine. Um, medium to large dog, uh, small to medium dog is fine. Anything larger gets a bit more, bit, I was going to say a bit hairier, excuse the pun, <laughs> but gets a little bit more difficult, um, but by no means impossible, but will just make your pool of properties available to you significantly smaller. Moving down now to, of course, if you've got children. So children tend to start school here. Well, children do start school here at the age of four. So if you're moving over um, to bring your child to school, uh, then it might be an idea to start to actually find the school first before finding the property. So again, unlike in the UK, um, you won't be guaranteed a place at a school just because you live in the neighborhood. So you should always search for the school first, get accepted, and then from there, if you want to be in close proximity to, proximity to the school anyway, and then find the rental property from that. So it's sometimes better to work backwards. And then the final thing that I'd like to mention now is budget. So here in Amsterdam, we abide by a rule called the three times rule. So the idea behind that is that your gross monthly salary, this includes the 8% holiday pay if you're entitled to that, um, your gross monthly salary should equate to three times the value of your monthly rent. 
So the thought behind this is a third of your salary would go to rent, a third will go to bills, food, health insurance, all of that boring stuff, <laughs> and then a third will go to your recreational use. So that's the general rules behind the three times rule. Now, when it comes to this, um, always kind of be, yeah, use that as a good guide, because for example, if you were to have a very large income and then look for a property with quite a, with quite a modest budget, then the landlord might see your contract and say, hey, this guy can afford a lot more. Um, let's give this property to someone who the three times rule actually like fits in. And again, of course, vice versa, if you have quite a modest income and are looking for something, for something with a greater budget, again, the landlord, landlord will say, hey, this doesn't fit in with the three times rule. We can't accept that. So always just kind of be realistic. And again, try and abide by the three times rule as a good marker. Now I'm just gonna read through some top tips that, uh, well, most of us here working at Expat Housing Network are expats. And these are all tips that we wish we'd known before we moved here. So hopefully these will be helpful, helpful for you uh, on your relocation. First off, if registration is not possible, it's a sublet. I've said it, I say this constantly, please steer clear. It's a sublet, it's illegal, and it won't end up, it won't end up ni nicely if you can't register. The next point I'll mention is written offers that are accepted are legally binding, so, and you can be fined for backing out. Now for this, we would never suggest to put two offers on two different properties at the same time, because if they were both to get accepted, then the chances are you will be fined up to a month's worth of rent um, in order uh, for breaking that acceptance. So always make sure that if you if you yeah always make sure that you put an offer on a property that you actually want to go for. Try not to do it two at a time. There is of course uh, the chance that if you did put two offers on and one got accepted, then you could call the other one quickly to cancel that and to retract your offer. That's fine, uh, but it's always just risky business having two offers on at the same time. And next one, of course, as I've, as I've mentioned before, the landlords can't simply evict you. So know your rights. Um, as long as you're paying rent and as long as you're looking after the property, then there's absolutely no reason to evict you. When it comes to repairs in your rental property, when it comes to anything that's up to 100 euros, this tends to be the tenant's responsibility. So this can be changing lights, of course, uh, maybe repairing a washing machine, those kind of smaller things, but anything over um, is that's when it becomes the landlord's responsibility. Unless, of course, it was damage that you that you did yourself. So if you accidentally broke a window, that would absolutely be up to you. But when it comes to things, for example, like, oh, I don't know, uh, foundation issues or the boiler, then that's all up to the landlord. Another thing to mention is rent can be increased yearly if it's mentioned in the contract. Now, these uh, increases are always based on in, and regulated by inflation. So you're not going to suddenly have like a 50% increase. It's normally about 1%. And a good thing to note is that um, the rent can only increase a maximum of 2.4% in three years that you're staying there. So it's never going to be a vast change. But please note that this does need to be mentioned on your contract. If it's not, then they've got no right to increase your rent by anything. Thing. So just look out for that when you're reading your contract. Ooh, Ooh technology. Okay. Uh, another thing that I'd like to mention is when it comes to insurance, we would always re highly recommend getting liability insurance. Liability insurance pretty much covers you for anything. So say, for example, if you were cycling and you accidentally hit a parked car, you would be covered by your liability insurance. And this costs something along the lines of around three euro sixty per person per month. So it's really not much out of pocket um, and it really protects you for a lot. Other things that we would add, uh, that we would definitely uh, recommend to consider would be home contents insurance if you're living in an unfurnished apartment and it's your belongings, of course, and legal insurance. But we would always really highly recommend at least liability insurance. The final thing I'd like to mention now is Macalares, uh, that's the Dutch word for real estate agents, they should not be charging you a fee unless you have specifically asked for their help. Occasionally, you might find an agent who asks um, to, to, uh, to ask for a fee simply to view a property before, even if you don't know if you want to put an offer on it, they should not be asking that. So just note that your rights are, if you have not specifically asked someone for their help and for their services, they should not be charging you a fee. Here are some useful links um, that will, yeah, 
well, that I hope will help you uh, throughout your relocation. So the first off is the municipality. The Dutch word for that is the gemeente. This is where you can register your address and where you can pay taxes. Of course, not the funnest things, but things that you have to do. So it's very good to look at the gemeente uh, website. Now in Amsterdam is a one-stop shop for expat registration. So um, if you have any questions when you about registering in Amsterdam, just contact in Amsterdam, and this is where you can register and therefore get your BSN number. And then the next one is the IND, which is of course the immigration department, which can, which can help you with your visas, of course. And then the final one that we'll mention is WON. So WON is a nonprofit and it's an institute for questions, complaints about renting. So if at any point you're unsure about something that's in your contract or if your landlord's asking you to do something or pay something that you're not sure is legal, you can always go to WON and ask for advice. Now I'm going to quickly walk you through our service packages. So at AHN, we've got three types of rental packages. The first one being basic. Um, in this, we'll have a quick intake with you, find out what you're looking for in, your, in a home and understand your current situation. And throughout this package, you will have complete access uh, to the rental team. So if you've got any questions, thoughts, concerns, or, looks, or looking for advice, you can contact us at any point. We also provide you with guides and checklists so you know exactly what to look for and ask for when you're at your viewings, when you're at your check-in. Um, we also give you a breakdown on how to do your searches properly and what to look out for. So those would all be given to you. Once you've done your search and you've reviewed a property that you'd like to put an offer on, we will then submit that offer on your behalf so that the agent knows that it's coming from a trusted from a trusted agency um, and we will also put together a little pro uh, profile about you guys we find that agents prefer uh, agents and landlords prefer to see their tenants as people rather than numbers so that's why we'll we'll put a little paragraph about you guys as well we'll then of course review the contract for you as well once the offer has been accepted to make sure it's legal and it's as it should be and we'll then set up your utilities for you of course underneath your name and your current uh, and your new address this package uh, costs 599 euros. That's already including VAT. And we request a deposit of 99 euros at the beginning, which is then deducted from the final invoice. Moving on to, uh, to the second package up, it's got everything that I've said in the basic. Apart from at this point, we will conduct a search on your behalf and we'll also schedule the viewings on your behalf. Now, this, uh, this package costs 999 euros, again, already including VAT. We do require a deposit of 199 euros, which is then deducted from the final cost. And then finally, we'll be moving on to the complete package. And this one is, as described, the complete package. <laughs> so at this point, we will then attend the viewings with you and we'll attend the check-in with you as well to make sure that everything's listed um, in your inventory. Something that we have found, especially during COVID, um, as people, it's well, it's harder to travel. And as people are having to quarantine, lots of people have been wanting to do everything virtually and then just directly move into their apartment once they land in Amsterdam. So this is also something that we can offer with the complete package and that we would be attending the, uh, the viewings on your behalf. And we can do video viewings, either live um, or pre-recorded, whichever suits you best. And similarly, we'll also attend the check-in on your behalf and make sure everything's listed with the agent and the landlord. And then when you're ready to land, we can just, figure out a time to give you the keys and you can just move directly into your property. This package costs 1,999 euros. Um, and this is again, already including VAT. And the, um, the deposit is 299 euros, which is then deducted from the final cost. Now, if you're unsure if you want to buy, you might want to buy, we do have buying webinars coming up. Um, the, our next one is on the 7th of July, and this is buying in the Netherlands. Uh, you can either register via Eventbrite or check, out, uh, check it out on our website as well. We do have also city specific uh, buying webinars coming up as well. So there's Utrecht, Eindhoven, The Hague, um, a whole list so if you're looking for that have a yeah have a look at our website um and they're a free event just like this and um it's with our managing director and mr mortgage which is a mortgage advisor um so they'll be able to answer any questions that you've got there as well and if you just want a little bit of a bite size uh, conversation uh, or learning uh, a learning session about buying. We do also do a weekly lunch and learn, which is every Friday um, from 12.30 till uh, one, maybe quarter past one, depending on the Q&A at the end. So if you just want a little bite-sized session, we do host those uh, once a week on Fridays. Again, you can get all of the information for that on our website. I hope that was helpful.
my name is Mary. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me at welcome at ehn.works. And I hope you found this helpful. And I'll now move on to the Q&A. Let's see. Yeah. All right. So my first question is from Saskia. And Saskia is asking, how would landlord know about your salary? So when you're putting an offer on a property, uh, then you need to uh, you need to give two documents, your work contract and your passport. So when it comes to this, this is how the landlord would know your salary because he needs to see your contract. I hope that was helpful. Bear with, I think I'll stop sharing and then maybe this will make everything easier. Ah, here you go. Carlos says, when you say 20 minutes, what is the reference? So when it comes to the 20 minutes, I'm assuming you were talking about from the metropolitan areas. Um, so that would be via tram or by train. I hope that was helpful. If you've got any questions, if, if you want me to clarify, please feel free to pop more questions in the Q&A. Of course, I'll answer as best I can. And Leonardo says, how long does it take usually the whole process from starting looking for a property and actually to start living, considering smart or complete packages? So this is, of course, it of course varies depending on the client. It varies depending what's on the market, but our internal goal and average from search to check-in is two weeks. So that is our internal goal and average. But of course you might get some, um, we've, we've had some clients who wanna have more and more searches and that can take a couple of months. On the flip side, some people might wanna view the first property, uh, might wanna put an offer on the first property and get accepted within the week. So it's, it does vary, but like I said, our internal goal and average is about two weeks, but I think you'd be absolutely safe by saying a month would give you plenty of time and there wouldn't be any too much stress. Carlos now asks, do real estate agents specialize in areas in Amsterdam? Yes, yes, absolutely. So there are different, um, well, when you when I say Amsterdam, they'll, they'll specialize in, yeah, the city of Amsterdam because it's so small so it's not going to be like I'm going to specialize in De Pipe for example or I'm going to specialize in Nord um, when you but of course real estate agents will specialize in certain small metropolitan areas and Carla says does the 1999 package include searching for schools unfortunately not so the schools would be all on you we are just housing specialists Carlos now asks, what areas are the best for expats with kids? So I think at this point, when it comes to Amstelveen and Boutenveldert, because there is an international school near there, um, that's very popular for expats with kids. Also, uh, with it being in Amstelveen and, and Boutenveldert, it's very easy to commute to Amsterdam. Um, and also, there tends to be a lot more space, so you're, you're more likely going to be able to get a little house with a little garden. So that, that might be a good idea for you. Yes, I can write the names for you. Uh, da, da, da. I'll write it in the message, if that's okay, in the chat. So there's Amstel, Vane, and Bouten Veldert. All right. If you've got any further questions, please feel free to send me through an email um, at welcome at ehn.works. I'm more than happy to, to help and advise accordingly. And like I said, we'll be sending you through this, uh, this webinar for you to watch in your own time. So if anything else comes up when you're rewatching it, you know where to find me. I really hope you guys found this useful and best of luck with your relocation. Like I said, it, does, it might seem overwhelming, but there are ways to maneuver it. So you'll be fine. <laughs> all right, have a lovely evening. And yeah, I hope to hear from you all soon. Thank you guys so much for coming.